Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Keep Cincinnati Beautiful Breakfast of Champions event. My name is Emily Rossetti. I am a KCB board member and resident of Northside, one of Cincinnati's 52 beautiful neighborhoods. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We're excited to have you. Before we dive into today's keynote from Rob Allott about his inspiring environmental work, I wanted to give you a brief overview of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful for our old and new friends. Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is a local Cincinnati nonprofit dedicated to empowering people to build community and create a positive future. This happens through neighborhood revitalization, education, and mobilization. Our grassroots network of people like you and our guests today help create a safer, cleaner space and higher quality of life for everyone. Since 1978, our mission has grown to include five programs, the Great American Cleanup, Environmental Services, Green Space, Arts, and Education. As a board member and resident of Cincinnati, I've had the pleasure of working with the organization for the past five years. What started out as a simple hour or two of volunteering has developed into a passion for keeping Cincinnati beautiful. What I love about the organization is the ability for anyone and everyone to get involved. Something as small as picking up a bag of trash on your street makes a huge impact, as you'll hear later. Our arts, green space, and cleanup staff help all over the city to beautify and clean up ordinary things, like walls and vacant lots, while our education team is tackling environmental issues at the earliest stages of childhood, encouraging our smallest citizens to do their part at home and throughout their future. I'd like to thank our staff and board committee for putting this event together. Also a huge thanks to the Cincinnati Film Commission for bringing Rob's story to life in the movie Dark Waters that was filmed right here in Cincinnati. The commission is dedicated to bringing stories about the environment to our TV screen. Thank you all for showcasing our city and everything it has to offer within the larger conversation about environmental activism. On behalf of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful, I encourage all of you to be present today and learn something, ask questions, have fun. At the end of the program, we'll provide opportunities on how you can get involved, either physically or financially, to help our organization thrive and help the greater community. Now it's time to grab your coffee while I send it off to Jonathan Aidy, our executive director, to just start today's program. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Aidy. I'm the executive director of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, Planning Committee, staff, and thousands of volunteers of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful, I would like to welcome you to our first annual and hopefully last virtual Breakfast of Champions, which celebrates the work that is being done in Cincinnati to make all of us safer, healthier, and more connected. This has been a crazy planning process, and although it isn't quite how we originally drew it up, we are proud that you have chosen to share part of your morning with us. This morning, you're going to be hearing from some champions who have made a difference in all of our lives through their passion, dedication, leadership, and altruism. We are thrilled that Rob Balat is going to be our guest speaker. The movie Dark Waters first came to our attention when we were contacted by the film crew, as much of the movie was being filmed in Cincinnati. They wanted to do a cleanup in the business district in association with the filming. His fate would have it the cleanup was snowed out, but the release of the film was something that was on our radar. I took our entire staff to see the movie when it came out to remind all of us that a small group of dedicated people can change the world. As a matter of fact, it is the only thing that has ever done so. You will also be hearing from our mayor and vice mayor, both of whom continue to champion the work that we do and provide the means to do it. Also, our fearless leader and board chair, Brad Lendner, will be presented with the prestigious Carolyn Creighton Award. It's the highest award from our parent organization, Keep America Beautiful. It will indeed be a full agenda, so we will keep things moving quickly. Once the program has concluded, you'll be invited to join us on our Facebook Live page for some Q&A with Rob Balot. We hope that you take advantage of that opportunity. Rob has also agreed to provide signed copies of his best-selling book, Exposure, to anyone who contributes $100 or more to our campaign. Next up on our agenda is my good friend and Vice Mayor Christopher Smitherman. Once again, we're glad that you're here to join us. Thank you, Jonathan. It is my pleasure to be a part of the first Keep Cincinnati Beautiful Breakfast of Champions. KCB is near and dear to my heart, and we are thrilled to partner with KCB to make our city safer, cleaner, healthier, and more connected. 
I have made it a habit of picking up trash and I see it and encourage my friends and families to do the same. To paraphrase Edward Everett Hill, I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something. Keep Cincinnati beautiful and its thousands of volunteers take that message to heart and they do an awful lot of something for our city and our neighborhoods. One person who has done an incredible amount of something is our guest speaker for this morning. Rob Balot is a partner in Taft's Environmental Litigation and Product Liability and Personal Injury Groups. For more than 29 years, Rob has handled a wide variety of highly complex environmental matters and related toxic torque litigation for a diverse array of clients, including the nation's first cases involving PFAS drinking water contamination. To date, Rob has secured benefits in excess of $1 billion for clients impacted by PFAS contamination, including through key leadership positions in the nation's first class action personal injury, medical monitoring, and multi-district litigation and trials. In 2017, Rob received the International Right Livelihood Award, also known as the alternate, Alternative Nobel Prize for his decades of work on PFAS issues. Rob is the author of the book, Exposure, Poison Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. And his story is the inspiration for the major motion picture, Dark Waters, from participant media and focus features starring Mark Ruffalo as Rob. If you have yet to see Dark Waters, you definitely should. If you have seen it, you should see it again. His story is also featured in the documentary available on Netflix, The Devil We Know. Rob is a graduate of the New College of Sarasota, Florida, and has a Juris Doctorate degree from the Ohio State University College of Law. Without further ado, settle in and listen to Rob tell us his amazing story. Good morning, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Balot, and it's really an honor and privilege for me to be here today to help support the work of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful and those here in our community that do what they can to help protect and improve our environment. You know, I'm an environmental lawyer. I have spent the last 30 years of my career here at Taft, Statinius & Hollister in Cincinnati. The first eight years or so of that career, I spent helping our corporate clients try to comply with all the different environmental laws that existed under the federal and state rules. And one day in 1998, I got a call on my office phone from a gentleman who identified himself as a farmer out in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And he started telling me about cows that were dying on his property. And I had no idea why he was calling me, or I was about to hang up the phone actually, when he mentioned you know, that he actually had gotten my name from my grandmother. Uh, my mom's family had grown up outside of Parkersburg, and this man had been looking for somebody who could help him figure out what was happening to his cows. Uh, and he'd been talking to his neighbor that day who just happened to have been on the phone with my grandmother. And she said, hey, my grandson's an environmental lawyer up in Cincinnati. He can help you. So I listened. I listened to try to figure out what was happening with the cows. Um, and he explained he had all kinds of videotapes and photographs. If somebody would just listen to him and look at this information, I, we would see what was happening. So I invited him to come on up to our offices. This was back in October of 1998. He and his wife drove up to Cincinnati with, armed with videotapes, photographs, we looked at him. We, we sat down and watched these tapes. And he was right. Taking a look at these videos, you could see white foaming water coming out of a creek, cows standing in this water that were developing tumors, dropping, uh, animals dropping dead, blackened teeth. Uh, it wasn't just the cows. It was fish and turkeys and deer in the area. So taking a look at this, and we could see that the water was coming out of something marked landfill owned by the DuPont Company. DuPont was, of course, one of the world's largest chemical companies, and they had a massive facility right down the road along the Ohio River, and they owned this landfill. And so we thought, hey, this is a, a permitted landfill. This is the kind of thing I do with our corporate clients. 
I help them get permits for landfills like this. I, can, I, I could get to the bottom of this. There's probably some sort of regulated, listed, uh, hazardous material in this landfill that's causing these problems. All we need to do is pull these permits, look up what's being discharged out of that landfill, and we can get to the bottom of it. So we agreed to take that case on back in 1998. And um, what we found out was it was a lot more complicated than that. We couldn't find anything on the permits or the identified list of hazardous materials at that landfill that would be causing any of these problems. What I found out one day was that there was a completely unregulated chemical there at that landfill, something I'd never heard of called PFOA. And I couldn't find any information about it anywhere in any of our literature, any of the scientific studies or regulations, nothing, nothing ever referred to this chemical. So I started asking the company for their documents on it. And we started getting, we had to go into court and fight about it, but we eventually got all their documents about this chemical. And as I started to dig through these hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, what we saw was this was a completely unregulated material, but it had been in use for almost 50 years at that point, manufactured right after World War II, completely man-made chemical, and it had these very uh, uh, disturbing qualities. It had been shown by the internal company studies. Uh, the DuPont itself had been studying this chemical for decades and found that it was toxic. It caused all kinds of different effects in different animals and different organs. It caused cancer in rats that had been studied. And most disturbingly, it had this unique ability to get out and get into living things and stick to the blood and build up over time. It was persistent. It could accumulate in people and living things. And not only that, once it got out into the environment, it was almost impossible for it to break down. It was considered uh, almost non-degradable. Um, and so when we started looking at all this information, we realized that not only was this a nasty, toxic, persistent chemical that was being used by DuPont, DuPont had taken about 7,000 tons of sludge soaked with this chemical and dumped it into a landfill one day. And where was that landfill? right next to this farmer's property in West Virginia. So once we figured all this out, we were able to resolve that case for the, the, the farmer who was known as uh, Mr. Tennant, Wilbur Tennant and his family. But, but through that case, we came to understand that this was something that went far beyond this case for Mr. Tennant and his family, went far beyond one farm in West Virginia with farmers. It involved chemical that had made its way out into the drinking water of the entire community. The company had known this, unfortunately had covered it up for decades. Tens of thousands of people had been drinking this chemical since the 1980s at least in their water. So we realized there was a massive public health threat here. So I sent a letter to the EPA in 2001 to warn them of this. We ended up filing a lawsuit on behalf of the entire community in 2001. That led to the US EPA finally realizing this chemical existed, doing massive investigations. They actually sued DuPont over this. We, we ended up finally resolving the case uh, for the community uh, through a massive settlement that involved the company putting in water filtration systems, and most importantly, doing independent science to confirm what this chemical would actually do to people that drank it over time. 70,000 people participated. It took seven years, but the community came together and made sure that this science was done to confirm what this chemical would do to people. And by the time that science was done in 2012, the, the rest of the world finally started to learn that this chemical was out there. And it wasn't just this chemical. This chemical was part of an entire family of chemicals we now call PFAS also known as forever chemicals, because once they get out in the environment, they don't break down, they stay there virtually forever. As that information slowly started to trickle out, different states, different people across the United States started saying, hey, what is this? Why is this in our water? Yet the general public still didn't know much about it until 2016, when the New York Times Magazine finally published a story that summarized this whole history of what had been known about this chemical, what had been covered up, and the fact that it was all over the country, if not all over the world. At that point, we, we had f folks came in from the media who wanted to publicize the fact that this was out there. This was, this was something affecting the entire country. We had a documentary made called The Devil We Know that came out in 2018. And then I got a call one day from Mark Ruffalo. You may know him as the Hulk in, in movies, saying, this is an important story. 
You've got chemicals now that we know are not only in the drinking water in West Virginia and Ohio, they are likely in the water all over the United States, if not all over the entire world. The chemical was starting to be found in the blood of polar bears, almost every living creature on the planet. How do we bring this story to a bigger audience? So in 2019, Mark Ruffalo teamed up with Participant Media and they started a film. And I'm proud to say that we were able to do that here in Cincinnati. A lot of it was filmed at the Taft Law Offices here downtown. And we were able to put together a film that showed this entire story of this contamination and how it impacts the entire world. This is a story of, uh, of contamination on an unprecedented scale. Virtually every creature and every person on this planet is now dealing with this contamination. So we were able to get that story filmed here in Cincinnati. We're able to get that story out. It came out just late last year, and we've been seeing an incredible um, level of activity ever since then. States are moving forward to set appropriate drinking water standards. Discussion is occurring now for the first time on the national level to establish appropriate safety standards for all of these chemicals. Discussions occurring internationally. International treaties and, and, and international laws are being discussed to try to ban and, and restrict these chemicals worldwide. And all of this stems back to a single individual in West Virginia who stand, stood up and said, something's wrong here. Something's impacting my environment. We need to do something about it. And the entire community that got behind him stood up with him and made sure the environment was protected. And I'm really proud that we were able to, to contribute to this story and help bring it to the rest of the world right here in Cincinnati. And I'd really uh, hope that that helps inspire others to know that a single person can make a huge change. The community, community members getting together, working to protect the environment, uh, can have dramatic change worldwide. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here and support this organization and the tremendous work that's being done to protect our environment, not, here, not only here in Cincinnati, but all over the world. Thank you. Good morning, Cincinnati. My name is Helen Lohman, and I have the great fortune of being the president and CEO of Keep America Beautiful. I'm so sorry we can't all be there together today. That would be wonderful. Um, and just to be together to celebrate the great work of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful and specifically Brad Lindner, the 2019 Individual Achievement Carolyn Creighton Award recipient. Let me start by telling you a little bit about Carolyn Creighton. This award is named in honor of the longtime Keep America Beautiful board member who is credited with advancing Keep America Beautiful's community-based affiliate network. And she started all of that in at, at the affiliate called Keep Macon Bib Beautiful Commission, which is located in Macon, Georgia. And all of that began in 1974. And Carolyn still serves on the Keep America Beautiful Board of Directors and the Keep Make It Bib Beautiful Board of Directors. And today she, she's still influencing um, all of our work across the United States, and specifically locally in communities in the state of Georgia. But today we're honoring somebody who is so deserving of this Individual Achievement Award and who carries on the legacy of Carolyn Creighton. Brad Lindner, President and CEO of United Dairy Farmers, otherwise known as UDF, is this year's award recipient. The entire Lindner family and UDF has been an important part of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful for nearly its entire 40-year history. In 1980, UDF became KCB's very first corporate partner in Cincinnati's Great American Cleanup. Now, 40 years later, UDF remains one of KCB's most valuable corporate partners as the primary sponsor of Cincinnati's Neighborhood Enhancement Program, which tackles litter, blight, and enhances neighborhoods twice per year. And to top it all off, Brad has served as KCB board president for the past 15 years. On behalf of Keep America Beautiful, I congratulate Brad on his award and express my sincere gratitude to him 
for the support and leadership that he provides Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. Thank you, Helen, for this wonderful award. It's very, very appreciated. I have to tell you that I had a delightful conversation with Carolyn back in February, and what a gracious and lovely individual she is. I'm so very proud to receive an award named after her. I'm also really proud to work with such a great affiliate of Keep America Beautiful, Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. The staff there is energized, committed, innovative, and above all, efficient. We do so much for the city and the impact that they have is, is incredible. And we're very, very lucky to have such a strong chapter here representing Keep America Beautiful. Usually Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is in the top one, two, or three in the national competition. And Cincinnati should be very, very proud to know that they have such a strong group representing us and doing such great work for our community. Once again, thank you. Hi, I'm John Cranley, Mayor of Cincinnati. In 1978, when I was four years old, the city of Cincinnati incorporated Clean Cincinnati, which we now know as Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. What is Keep Cincinnati Beautiful? It is a great expression of community that we pick up after each other. Now, we all agree that people shouldn't litter, and we encourage people not to litter. But we all know that society is sustained and built by people who go the extra mile. And just as our parents looked after us and cleaned up after us, we all have to clean up after our city to make it the most beautiful city it can be. And for over 40 years now, Keep Cincinnati Beautiful has been organizing thousands upon thousands of volunteers to give back and to make this a more beautiful city. And they have really enhanced the relationships with corporate community in recent years, including tremendous partnerships with Gorilla Glue, Procter & Gamble, and the United Dairy Farmers. And I want to thank those companies for lending their support. And it's also about getting young people involved to understand the importance of cleanliness and not littering, which is why they work with over 25,000 Cincinnati Public School students each year. And over the last several years, uh, they have made a specific effort to work on abandoned, boarded up buildings. And they have painted over 1,000 of these buildings. What was a blight is now a piece of the fabric. And uh, people who live in those neighborhoods uh, have a nicer neighbor, even if it's a vacant neighbor. But at its core, Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is an educational agency. And they are teaching us all how to be better citizens. Before I turn it over to Jonathan Addy, a great leader of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful, for thoughts and then some question and answer session with Rob Blott, I would like to add my personal congratulations to my good friend, Brad Linder, who is a champion for Keep Cincinnati Beautiful, the owner and CEO of United Dairy Farmers, been a fabric and part of our community forever, but he's also been a major champion for Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. So I want to congratulate him too for his tremendous service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Cranley. Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is dedicated to recycling everything that should not be going into the trash can. Let's see how it's done.
very much, Rob, for taking the time to speak with our champions today. And thank you, too, for answering some of the questions that have been submitted in advance from the champions. So um, I'm just going to ask some of the questions, and okay. we'll, we'll see where that conversation leads. Uh, since the movie Dark Waters was released, have you been involved in any new environmental safety initiatives? Yeah, actually, we are still pursuing the PFAS problem. Um, you know, as after the movie came out, we realized this was really involving hundreds, if not thousands, of related chemicals in the same chemical family, mm -hmm. and they're being found in water all over the country and in the blood of everyone all over, over the country. Um, we are uh, we've brought a new case where we're trying to have the companies um, that put these chemicals out there pay for nationwide studies by independent scientists to confirm exactly what these chemicals are doing to everybody. So that litigation um, is pending right now in federal court in Ohio, and we've got cases actually going on all over the country right now for states, water providers, uh, different impacted parties that um, you know are dealing with the, uh, the fallout from the PFOS chemical contamination. How do you keep it all straight? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there's, there's a lot going on, um, but it's good to see that there's also a lot of um, growing awareness you know, among the, the different state regulators, the federal regulators, a lot of activity finally happening to uh, try to restrict the chemicals, ban them. There's some international activities going under, underway right now to try to restrict this whole family of chemicals. Wow. When you leave the courtroom for the last time, what would you like your legacy to be? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, I hope uh, it would be that we helped um, really increase awareness, understanding of, um, you know, that our environment includes not only what we can see, but what mm -hmm. we don't see. You know, we've got these invisible chemicals out there in our drinking water, in our soil, in our air, uh, in, uh, in us, in our bodies. Um, so hopefully, you know, maybe uh, increased awareness of the scope of what the environment really is. How does your, all the knowledge that you've obtained through this process kind of impacted what your day-to-day -day life is like? You know, um, I, I think I, when I look back before Mr. Tennant walked in my door in 1998, um, you know, I think I was a little naive in just assuming, I think as maybe a lot of us do, that you know, like when we turn the faucet on, you know, that there's somebody that's, that's taking care of all this. Somebody's looking at all of this. Somebody's out there checking every chemical and making sure things are safe and making sure our drinking water is safe. And really, you know, what I've, what I've learned um, is it's really up to each of us as individuals and uh, within our own communities to, um, to really take it on ourselves, uh, to make sure that things are kept clean and make sure that our own environment is not being contaminated. We can't assume somebody's doing it for us. What can average citizens like our champions who are viewing today do to make a difference in their community and preserve the environment? Yeah, I'm hoping everybody realizes that um, you know, each one, each person can make a huge difference. Uh, just standing up, speaking out, you see something in your own um, personal environment or in your, your own community that you think needs to be addressed, do something, you know, speak out, uh, take action. You know, hopefully they, they see the story of somebody like Mr. Tennant, you know, or Joe Kiger, you know, people in a community, small community along the Ohio River, just not that far from here you know, that we're able to do that and took on one of the biggest chemical companies in the world and we're able to, to do something, you know, even if it was just, you know, um, uh, minor steps that they were able to take in their own community led to a chain reaction that now um, is leading to everybody all over the planet really understanding um, that they're facing a, a major health threat. What, um, what do you think are some of the major environmental threats kind of besides PFAS that are um, affecting our, our near future? Um, you know, it's, uh, I think beyond PFAS, you've got just the general um, threat from unregulated contaminants, I think. Um, you know, obviously that's sort of in, in the, the, the forefront of my, uh, my thoughts here. 
that's something I work on all the time. But um, again, you know, this this idea that nothing's out there. Uh, if it was harmful, you know, if there was mm -hmm. something harmful, somebody would have prevented this right. from 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 being in our products, from being in our in our drinking water, the food we eat, the clothes we put on. Um, you know, I think we just really need to be much more aware of, um, of the the things we can't see, the, the chemicals that are being used in our daily products. Um, and, you know, even if we take a look at the label, you know, there are, not everything is required to be on a label. And there are a lot of things that um, um, are, are out there, getting out there, getting in us that we just don't know about. And it's uh, really important for every person to take it on themselves to learn as much as they much as they can about what they are exposing themselves to. Um, this next question, I think, comes from a fan of the Hulk. Um, <laughs> what is it like getting a call from Mark Ruffalo? Bizarre and very surreal. Um, you know, that was uh, an interesting day. Um, you know, when he reached out, uh, but you know, he's such a great guy and just really passionate about wanting to make sure this story got out um, and that. You know the movie Dark Waters that there was that it was done the right way, um, and you know he was very passionate about the environment. He's been involved in environmental issues for years, and was just blown away that this was something that nobody had talked about. You know, it was it was all over the country, all over the world. Um, it just was such a nice guy, uh, just the most down to earth, genuine person you'll ever meet. He was uh, just perfect for for this role. So what do, you, what do you think makes the Cincinnati area beautiful? What, what's your favorite way to, to keep your neighborhood and your community beautiful? I guess there's so many different aspects of it. You know, there's the physical environment. You've got the hills, the rolling hills, and so green. You know, uh, you even drive an hour away and it's a totally different environment. You've got the woods in the forest. Um, and you know, people here are really uh, committed to keeping things green and keeping you know trees and, and preserving those kinds of neighborhoods, the architecture, um, you know, and the people, the people themselves, you know, are a huge uh, part of the environment here. Um, you know, I do what I can to um, uh, plant as many trees, for example, as I can in my yard. Uh, and do what we can to, to make sure that um, you know this community stays as unique as it is. I was struck in the the movie and the book and the document doc documentary how Mr. Tennant would take such painstaking notes and such um, he did such a great job of collecting data. Uh, what could ordinary citizens do if they suspect that something like this with that kind of chemical or another kind of product was happening in their community? Speak up, you know, actually do, uh, do what you can to find out if there are others out there already that may be dealing with a similar issue. For example, you know, just using PFOS as an example. Uh, there are communities all across the country that are learning about it and, you know, have never heard of this stuff and are assuming that this is something new and they're the only ones that are dealing with it. Um, and the reality is there are people all over the world, you know, that are dealing with the same issue. There are groups that are getting together, individuals that are able to, to, to connect online and form community groups and organizations that are able to, to, to collectively get their voice heard. Um, so, I mean, if there's anything that might pop up, uh, you could speak up about it and take action on your own and um, you'd be I think be surprised to find out how many other people probably share the concern. What is your proudest moment throughout this journey? Hmm, that's a <laughs> there are there are a number of uh, times where you know, I, I was really happy that we were able to help Mr. Tennant and his family and really be able to get him some resolution of what was happening to him. And then, you know, with the community, being able to get those folks clean water, uh, the appropriate medical testing, be compensated, um, you know, and then to see the story finally come out in a broader way and to see, you know, be in front of the European Union uh, and in the UK and have members of parliament talking about Mr. Tennant and his story. Uh -huh. I think he would have been very proud to know, you know, that, um, 
you know, just from him standing up and taking action, you know, it led to people people knowing this all over the world, and that was incredible to see that. Is there a moment between all this, the the court battle, documentary, book, major motion picture, that made you just stop and think, wow, look at the impact that I've made? You know, it's just been this ongoing cumulative um, battle. Uh, you know, it started with Mr. Tennant and being you know, coming in saying we've got to we've got to find a way to get this information out and to make sure that what's going on here stops and that people know about it. And really, that's been a constant, ongoing struggle now for 22 years. Um, you know, and having the movie Dark Waters, the documentary, The Devil We Know, and the book, and all of the, the media coverage is, is helping finally get that story out. Um, and, you know, I plan to continue to keep doing it. Um, uh, as long as this stuff is still out there um, and it's still posing a threat, which it is, um, you know, still need to keep doing what we're doing. When it was your initial career day back in the day, what, what did you want to be when you, when you entered the field of work? I originally wanted to be an architect. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, for as, as long as I can remember as a kid, um, you know, I liked to design, to design buildings and the design of cities and the way cities uh, fit together. And um, then I realized it involved a lot of math. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, that I changed my view and then I thought I wanted to be a city planner and help um, organize cities and, and make sure you know and help help make sure things are run efficiently and organized and um, and then one day my dad who actually uh, when I was uh, finishing up uh, high school he decided to switch careers and become a lawyer um, mm -hmm. and he encouraged me he said you know that you ought to look into law and maybe that the law degree will provide you some more interesting opportunities. So uh, I, I switched and, and uh, went to law school. <laughs> what was it like going from the corporate defense side to the work that you're doing now? It seems like a, a, a pretty large bridge to cross. You know, I guess I, uh, it didn't, I didn't really see it that way. I mean, my view was we were simply taking on a case for a client and we were going to do what we needed to do for that client just like we would do with a corporate client. I mean, we were going to to work as hard as we needed to, review as many documents as we needed to, incur whatever expenses we needed, you know, to order to make sure that um, we did what, what was necessary to represent him. Um, you know, as as time, as, as things went on and the case got a lot more complicated and it became clear that you know, this was something that was involving not just Mr. Tennant and his family, but this, an entire community or an entire industry. Um, you know, there were a lot of difficult choices that had to be made. Um, but again, you know, we were representing the, the, not only Mr. Tennant, but we were representing that entire community. Um, and we were going to do what needed to be done as long as it took. Um, many of us have come to know and love some of the characters in the documentary and the movie. Are there any that you kind of keep in touch with and just kind of let them know how things are progressing? Oh yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Tennant, Wilbur Tennant, and his wife both passed away. But uh, you know, I still keep in constant contact with his brother Jim. You know, who was actually you mm -hmm. see in the film and. He and his wife, Della, I, I speak to them all the time, and both of them had cameos in the movie. Um, you know, their, their, their children as well, Bucky Bailey. Um, you know, we were able to, to really got to spend uh, additional time as well throughout the filming with the documentary and with the film. He was able to, to actually have a cameo in the film as well. And Joe Kiger, you know, uh, all of those folks, you know, these are great people. Um, who you know also see this as an ongoing, continuing battle um, that isn't over yet. So thank you very much. Um, the you. the book is Exposure. The Netflix documentary, at least now it's on Netflix. By the time you see this, maybe on a different streaming service, is The Devil We Know, and the motion picture is Dark Waters. 
Thank you so much, Rob, for Thank spending you. so much of your time and, and just sharing your your passion and your uh, in your journey with us and our champions. Today. Thank you. I was delighted to be able to do it. Thank you all. Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is so thankful for the support of the city and our leaders. Thank you also to Vice Mayor Smitherman and Helen Lohman of Keep America Beautiful for your support and guidance. I also wanted to offer my congratulations and appreciation to Brad Lindner on behalf of our entire staff, board, and volunteers. Your calm and steady stewardship of this organization has led us through some pretty choppy seas, and we have always focused on the mission and our impact, and we are thrilled at this well-deserved honor. I also want to thank Rob Ballot for his message today, and more importantly, for the message that he continues to communicate by way of example. Rob is a shining example of the impact that one person can have when passion and perseverance meet up with talent. In hearing from our champions this morning, I am encouraged, motivated, and challenged. Throughout the pandemic, the most frequently asked question of us is, how can I help? I'd like to share some thoughts on that subject. To write the word crisis in Chinese characters is to combine the words for danger and opportunity. We are well acquainted with the dangers that COVID presents on our health, on the economy, on our educational systems, on connectedness. I would like to focus on the opportunity side of that equation. Many of us who are working from home or partly from home or who have a more holistic work schedule are afforded the opportunity to spend more time outside, more time in our neighborhoods during some of the hours where we might otherwise be behind a desk. Use that opportunity to do beautiful things right where you are. Keep Cincinnati Beautiful works hand in hand with all 52 neighborhoods to bring the health and safety benefits of beautification of public spaces. We want to expand that reach during this crisis. We are going to be announcing the return of the One Bag of Trash Challenge for Cincinnati. We will be challenging everyone to pick up just one bag of trash around where you work, live, or play. If only 5% of Cincinnati residents pick up one 20-pound bag of trash during this challenge, we would collect 330,000 pounds of trash and make our public spaces safer for our children to play, our neighborhoods more attractive for economic development and talent recruitment, and increase our connectedness to the environment. Speaking of trash, illegal dumping is a crime and costs Cincinnati more than $2 million annually to clean up. Illegal dumping is not a victimless crime. Other crimes against property and persons are allowed to flourish where environmental crimes are not checked. If you see something, say something. How we address illegal dumping says a lot about how we feel about our neighborhood. At our core, Keep Cincinnati Beautiful is an educational organization. Real change comes through education and behavior change. In this time of homeschooling and hybrid education models, use the opportunity to incorporate environmental education into the learnings of your children and your colleagues. Contact us how to learn more about how we can help. Like everybody else, COVID has hit KCB pretty hard. We were forced to make tough decisions to preserve our future and keep our staff and volunteers safe. As we learn more about what we can do safely, we invite you to resume volunteering with us. The size and proximity of groups will certainly be different for a time, but the work remains the same. The feelings of accomplishment and community will remain. We also certainly invite you to join with us as a supporter of Keep Cincinnati Beautiful. Contributions from champions like you have sustained us since our inception, and they are more valued than ever. Times are hard, but the ongoing challenges of our environment aren't going to wait for a COVID vaccine. Thank you for your contributions, and thank you for your faith that will enable us to continue this work. Thank you also to Rob Ballot for graciously providing signed copies of his best-selling book, Exposure, Poison Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle with DuPont, to anyone who contributes $100 or more through this event. We invite all of you to find that one battle that stirs your soul and pursue it with that kind of passion. Thank you everyone for joining with us. We are honored that you have spent part of your morning with us.